Okay, so uh, basically how this is going to go um, is the first hour and a half-ish is going to be just concepts. So in the, we're going to go like through this whole thing and it's going to be all the different concepts and we're going to review it all. Um, and then the second half are going to be practice problems. A lot of them are ones you guys already have access to because, yeah. Katrina just answered you guys. Um, it's going to be stuff that you guys have access to and then a couple special problems that they gave us. Someone wants muffins now. You bake yourself. I noticed muffins. it's like not filled in. Like, is it like something that like auto populates or whatever? What? Oh, no, I'm sorry. And I don't know if I should even be interrupting. Uh, I, I looked at the handout or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, not, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. For a second, I got very confused by auto populates. I was like, what does that mean? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not really here right now. Um, you guys have to fill it out. It doesn't get automatically filled out. So it's blank. And we're going to go through it. Should, yeah. yeah, but you could also just screenshot it. But it's better if you guys write it out. So yeah, let's get started. So first things first, we're going to go back to NMR. I know we've spent a lot of time on it, but we know how much they love their NMR. So yes, we are recording and the recording will be posted. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> I am trying to do this and look at the chat at the same time. So if you say something and we don't see it, just give us a moment. Um, also, yes to the emojis. Keep sending the emojis. I love to see it. Also, one last time. I'm going to send that in the chat. Pretty please fill it out. Okay. So what the heck is NMR? NMR is basically a spectroscopy technique that tells us about um, the carbon-hydrogen framework of a molecule. So NMR has to do with the spin of molecules. And we're basically going to use a magnetic pulse to find the resonance frequency um, I know the screen is oh no it's working fine on mine, so oh, okay. I think it just might be everybody's internet. Okay, so yeah, it it's doing the thing, just let it happen. If it takes a minute, whatever. If it's like three minutes or so and then you it still isn't working, um, let me know. Wow, I know you didn't mean it to be shady, but the comment was like, Will this video be uploaded on YouTube with audio this time? And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't mean to not have audio. <laughs> yes, hopefully it will have audio and everything will be fine. Um, also, since the screen is recording, like from, my, someone said I don't hear anything. That's, you're lying. Okay, anyway. <laughs> um Guys, I'm I'm so not here right now. I'm gonna stop looking at the chat. Okay, yes. So I'm not looking at the chat anymore. I'm just gonna restart. We're gonna do the thing and whatever. It'll be recorded. If the screen's not working, you can just watch later. It's fine. It's recording. All right. So restart. NMR. All you really have to know is that we're looking at the spin of molecules and we're um, using a magnetic pulse to find the resonance frequency. Cool. Good enough. That's all you need to know. So what exactly does it tell us and how? So NMR tells us the carbon hydrogen framework of a molecule. So it's basically telling you what the skeleton of the molecule looks like. And then what's the difference between NMR and IR? We can also include mass spec in this. So NMR is telling us framework, whereas IR 
tells us functional group and mass spec tells us the mass. So the criteria to be NMR active is having an odd number of protons and or not of or neutrons. So for example, carbon 13 has uh, six protons and seven neutrons. So this seven is an odd number, therefore this is NMR active. And this goes into the next question, which are the two common NMRs that we use. We use carbon 13 and hydrogen 1 NMRs. Um, you know, there's obviously a ton more, but for this class, we're just going to use those two. And for those two NMRs, the type of solvent that we're going to use is a deuterated solvent. And the reason we use this is because deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen, has its own NMR. So it doesn't mix with hydrogen or carbon NMR. So it doesn't produce any weird peaks. It doesn't interact. Um, and the one that we use most often is CdCl3. Okay, so now we have the calibration standard. So the calibration standard, um, what that basically means is when we calibrate an NMR machine, we kind of make it so that everything is equal, right? Um, so our zero reference point is the calibration standard, and it is TMS, which stands for tetramethylsilane. That looks like this. And this serves as the zero point because these methyls are going to be super duper shielded. So they're really, really shielded. So they're all the way at zero. And I will zoom out for a second. And I'll do this after every slide just so you guys can, you know, have your thing. The last question, what are the four main aspects we're gonna answer on the next slide? So, Three, two, one, moving on. So the four main aspects of NMR, <clears throat> the first one is going to be counting signals. Uh, okay. So when counting signals, it's really important that you look at symmetry. And you look at homotopic versus heterotopic versus enantiotopic versus diastereo. Those are really the big things that he could kind of trick you on. Uh, the other thing is carbon and hydrogen NMR signals are not always going to match. So make sure you're paying attention if it's carbon-13 versus HNMR. The next one is chemical shift. So chemical shift is basically telling us how shielded or deshielded A signal is. We're going to talk about the regions in just a couple minutes, um, but basically for this one, again, remember the difference between carbon-13 versus hydrogen NMR. Hydrogen is the more like 
important one that I suggest you remember all the regions for. Carbon-13 is kind of just like conceptually know the difference. Um, and just remember, smaller number equals more shielded. Next up, we have multiplicity slash splitting. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Yes. What did that say? Smaller number is what under chemical shift? Smaller number is more shielded. So the higher the number gets, the more deshielded it is. So the lower it is, the more shielded it is. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, so for multiplicity and splitting, there's a couple things we're going to talk about. So the first thing is the N plus... Actually, before we even talk about that, multiplicity and splitting is only for H and MR. This is not a thing for carbon NMR. Next up, um, we're going to have normal versus complex. So for normal splitting, we have the N plus 1 rule. For complex splitting, we have N1 plus 1 times N2 plus 2, not 2, sorry, 1. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but just know those are the formulas. In addition, in order to be counted as a neighbor, it has to be three bond lengths. So again, just to reiterate, in order to be counted as a neighbor, um, it has to be within three bond lengths. Um, and then this is where like J values and coupling constants come in. So we're gonna talk more about those, but essentially just remember, we're gonna say same J value equals normal splitting different J values equals complex splitting. And then there's one more thing that I am going to mention, but it's kind of weird. So we have the heteroatom rule. So as you guys might have noticed, uh, we told you something different in SI than your professors told you. It's complicated, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But basically, you can only split through a heteroatom if you specifically say you have a pure solution. And last but not least, we have integration. Oh my goodness. And so the integration is basically going to be number of H or C per signal. Very straightforward. One thing you want to know about integration is that it is a ratio. We'll talk about that later. But if you see on a spectrum there's one hydrogen uh, and one hydrogen, it could be that there's one or it could be that there's two or there's three. Um, so just know on a spectrum, it's a ratio. We'll talk about that a little bit more if you're just like, what the heck is that supposed to mean? So zoom out. We'll let you take a look-see. And at this point, if anyone has any questions about the intro to this stuff, and it wasn't answered already, let me know. Um, yeah, Rosemary, which um, bonds do we count? Do we count, like, how far, like, does the H, the C bond count as a bond length, or is it just carbon? Yes, so let me draw it for you right here. So 
it has to be hydrogen to hydrogen. It has, oop, sorry. Every single bond counts. So one, two, three. Okay, so they want to be able to get to the other methyl on the right. No, exactly. So one, two, three, it doesn't reach the hydrogen. It only reaches the carbon. Okay. Good question, though. Okay, I'll give it one more second. Um... <laughs> Okay, um, I am actually going to add one slide because I forgot to do this. Figures. Um, so we're very quickly going to talk about homotopic versus... What is the last point for an integration? Uh, one second. Yeah, so the last point for integration was ratio. So we're going to talk about that when you see an actual spectrum. Just know that like if it's 1, 1, 1, that could mean that there's one hydrogen in every signal, or it could mean there's two or three. Um, they just have to be like in a ratio. I don't know. It's hard to explain when you're, you're not looking at it. Okay. So homotopic, heterotopic, these are umbrella terms. Homotopic means same signal. Heterotopic means different signal. And I just want to make it very clear. These are relationship words, right? So we're only going to use homotopic and heterotopic to compare hydrogens. So you're not just going to say, oh, yes, this one hydrogen is homotopic. You're going to say, like, in comparison to something else, it's homotopic or heterotopic or whatever. So a little bit more specific, we have enantiotopic and diastereotopic. So enantiotopic, we're going to say that you need a potential chiral center. So what is a potential chiral center? A potential chiral center is basically um, any, sorry, my hair keeps getting stuck in my ring. It's any carbon that has two unique groups and two hydrogens. So for example, this guy is a potential chiral center because we have HA, HB, and two different groups. So when we have a potential chiral center like this, we can say that the relationship between HA and HB is enantiotopic. That means it's also homotopic because they are the same signal and have all the same chemical and physical properties. They just get a fancy name. And just for a good measure, I'll highlight them the same color so you know that they're the same. For diastereotopic, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, so I'm going to draw a line here. So in diastereotopic, we're going to split that up into chiral center and double bonds. And I know I'm kind of moving around the screen a little bit fast. I will, again, zoom out so you can see the whole thing. So for chiral centers, what this means is just like an antiotopic, we have to have a potential chiral center present, but we also have to have a pre-existing chiral center. So in this molecule, this carbon right here is a chiral center because there are four unique groups. There's this this, this, and this. And so if we have a chiral center present, every other potential chiral center will be diastereotopic. And I can repeat that. So when we have a chiral center present, every other potential chiral center 
is going to be diastereotopic. So our potential chiral center right here has HA and HB. Those guys are diastereotopic to one another. And one another. And this means that they are two completely different signals. So this is one signal. This is another signal. Um, so is this basically if we have a chiral center, all the other H's are dire stereotopic? Or is it just the one attached to the chiral center? So, okay, good question. Um kind of neither it's going to be every set of potential chiral centers not just the one next to it so not every single hydrogen but every other potential chiral center so let's say we have like the okay here we go oh right this is a chiral center so this guy this guy and this guy are all going to be diastereotopic, and this guy. So it's all the potential chiral centers, not the one right next to it. But let's say someone like this, who's a CH3, all of those are not going to be diastereotopic because this is not a potential chiral center. Hopefully that clears it up a tad. All right. Uh, and, yes. So potential chiral Potential chiral centers become diastereotopic if there's a chiral center nearby. Exactly, yeah. So to summarize, okay. when we have a chiral center, uh, I'll do equals. It means potential chiral centers are diastereotopic. Uh, what about double bonds? We're going to talk about that right now. So double bonds. There's a couple different things I have to show you for double bonds. But before I do that, I'm going to say for sorry. I saw a con comment and I got uh, distracted. So yes, for all of these potential chiral centers, each of these will be unique signals. So this will be one signal, two, three, four, five, six, so on and so forth. All right, so back to double bonds. Sorry for getting distracted. So for a double bond, there is like two rules that you need to follow. One, both H's must be on one carbon. And other carbon needs two different groups. And what I mean by that is double bond we're going to call one of these carbons one and the other one two. And bam, bam, bam. So carbon number one has to have two different groups. And again, they only have to be different from one another. So these are two different groups. And we're going to have two hydrogens on carbon two. So two different groups, two hydrogens attached to the same carbon. That means that these guys are diastereotopic. That means they're two completely different signals. But if we have something like this, now we have two hydrogens on the same carbon, but these are not two unique groups. They are symmetrical. So if this is the case, now, these two groups are just homotopic. They are exactly the same. Now, could you, could yes. you go over that one more time? I'm sorry. 
Yeah, no worries, of course. So basically, um, the two rules are both hydrogens must be on the same carbon, and we need two different groups on the other carbon. So here we have an ethyl and a methyl, but here we have two ethyl groups. So they are exactly the same. There's a line of symmetry. So that means these hydrogens are also symmetrical to one another. Um, okay, I see it. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. So let's say we have something like this. We have two unique groups and we have two hydrogens. However, the two hydrogens are on entirely different carbons. So the relationship between those guys is purely heterotopic. They are just completely different. So again, I just want to reiterate, diastereotopic is a class of heterotopic. So this one is diastereotopic and heterotopic. This one is just heterotopic. It doesn't have a more specific name. So I'm going to zoom out so you can see all of those again. And I know this is kind of confusing sometimes. So does anyone have any questions? I have a quick question real quick. Mm -hmm. So you said for the enantiotopic, it's any carbon with two unique groups and then two... Um, of the same hydrogen? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I have a question. So for an antiotopic, um, the two would count as like the same signal. So if you were counting signals, you wouldn't separate the two, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. So both of these would count as the same one signal. In this one, they each count as unique signals. Thank you. No worries. Yes, so um, the question was, in this scenario, it's homotopic but not an antiotopic, right? Yes, exactly. So again, homotopic and heterotopic are big uh, umbrella terms, and antiotopic and diastereotopic are more specific terms. So everything that is an antiotopic is inherently homotopic. Everything that is diastereotopic is inherently heterotopic. If he gives you something like this, right, and he says, what's their relationship? You have to pick an antiotopic because that's the most specific answer possible. So um, if he gives you something like this, yes, technically it is also homotopic, but the best answer is an antiotopic. For this example, though, it's not an antiotopic because the only time it can be an antiotopic is a potential chiral center and these are on a double bond. So your best answer is just homotopic. Yeah, so go for the most specific term. If there's no really specific term, then you have to go with general. Awesome. Alrighty, so that's the first little bit. So if you have any questions, please keep asking. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to switch over a little bit, and Katrina is going to start covering chemical shift. So here, I'll let you write that down while we do a little switch. You're muted. Thank you. I still don't know how to use technology. <laughs> I was just saying I feel so short compared to Rosemary. I sat in the chair and I'm like, damn, I am very low on this. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, Rosemary covered the main stuff. I like to call it the main stuff. But now we had to learn about chemical shifts. Not learn, but relearn, I guess. Okay. So... 
HNMR and CNMR are going to have two different regions, right? Like they do not have the same PPM type of situation. Okay. So HNMR is usually the one that you need to focus on. CNMR is just there for like, you know, whatever. And guys, yeah, Rosemary's on my computer. So it says that, she, that she's me. So I am Rosemary right now and she is Katrina. So, <laughs> okay. Anyways, I'm going to stop getting distracted. Why do we get so easily yeah. distracted? Uh, okay. We're just two bitches with no attention span. Our attention span is like the size of a fucking goldfish. So it's fine. <laughs> okay. All right. So... I always like to start from our most shielded, aka our lowest numbers, and then going over to our highest numbers. So in this like kind of 1 to 2.5 region, we have the alkyl region, right? Or you can call it the aliphatic. I just think alkyl sounds better. Aliphatic just sounds like a mouthful. So I just call it alkyl. So in that alkyl region, we will have things like CH3 or just like a plain old CH2 and so on and so forth. Nothing too special about them. Um, I still see the chat every now and then. <laughs> My brain's just like, what? Um, anyways, so the one thing that I do want to point out to you guys is that the ketone is actually going to fall in this area. And what I mean by the ketone, I mean like this, the carbons connected, like the hydrogens over here. These guys are part of the alkyl region. And it's because they're not like directly bonded to the carbonyl. So because of that, they're going to be in the alkyl region. And I'll give you guys an easier tip when we get to the carbonyl area about what goes in there. Okay, so with that being said, our 3 to our 5 ppm region, oh my gosh, I just realized I wasn't using the laser pointer. Um, <laughs> 3 to 5 region is going to be the heteroatom, right? I'm going to try and use different colors just because I feel like that's my mood right now. Heck yeah. All right, so this is our heteroatom region. So um, if you guys need to remember what your heteroatoms are, they are fawn. They are not fun, they are fawn. So F-O-N. And for some reason, I just started thinking about Plankton singing the fun song from SpongeBob. Huh. And of course, it was the destructive one. <laughs> Not the sweet little one. Okay. So the heteroatoms mean... Um, so something that a lot of people get confused about is whether or not it's going to be counted as a heteroatom. So I want you guys to know that the hydrogen can be directly bonded to the heteroatom, like in our alcohol. Or it can be a carbon away. So we can have it like O, carbon, and then their hydrogens. These hydrogens are still considered to be heteroatom. They're just going to be lower in shift. Meaning um, these guys would probably be closer to the three PPM while this one over here is probably gonna be closer to the five or the four region. <laughs> oh my God, let me stop looking at the chat. Okay. Didn't I close it? You did close it, oh. but I still see a little like thing pop up and my brain's just like, yes, everybody's seeing SpongeBob now. Okay. All right. So then our next region is five to seven and this is our double bond region, right? So I feel like that's relatively self-explanatory. So it's the hydrogens at the ends of a double bond, like so. Yay. Okay. Um, Double bond shouldn't be too difficult. So now we go on to our next region, which is 7 to 8.5. And that region is going to be our aromatic. Um, there is only one Can tone. I yes. Can a ketone be considered in the double bond region? Say that again. Yeah, a double bond. Can a ketone be considered a 5, point, a 5 to a 7 ppm since no. it has a double bond? No, the ketone will fall in the alkyl region because the hydrogen is a carbon away from the carbonyl so it's not there's no hydrogen here on this carbon okay thanks mm -hmm. okay so aromatic there's only one compound you guys need to care about when it comes to aromatic and that is our beautiful benzene i don't know if i'd call benzene beautiful but to me it's beautiful just like you guys all right so any hydrogen that's part of the ring there we go aromatic <laughs> okay so that leaves us with our last region, and this goes from 9 to 12, aka our most deshielded molecules here, which are our carbonyls. All right, specifically for HNMR, there's only two things um, that will be in this carbonyl region, and those are our aldehydes and our carboxylic acids. And when we're talking about the hydrogens that we're talking about in these areas, we're talking about this hydrogen here and this hydrogen here. So the reason I put them in this order is because if we were going to give approximate values for these, 
The aldehyde will be slightly lower in the car carbonyl region, so around the 9 ppm, while our carboxylic acid, I really hope I didn't just mess that up, but I probably did. Um, the carbonyl region is our 12 pp, closer to 12 ppm. So if you have something, oh, okay. <laughs> thumbs up. Um, if we have something all the way deshielded, it's probably going to be your carboxylic acid. Um, but if it's a little bit lower in like the 9 to 10 region, you might have an aldehyde. All right, so you guys can go ahead and take a screenshot of our beautiful HNMR. Um, any questions or concerns about this so far? Could you explain one more time why the alkyl um, umbrellas CH3 and CH2? Yes. So the alkyl is, I just like thinking of the alkyl as like super freaking boring. So they're just a bunch of carbons and hydrogens. So if they're not like, if they're not, if we had something, I'm trying to like figure out the best way to explain this. If we just had a molecule like this that just had a bunch of just carbons and hydrogens, all of these guys would fall underneath the alkyl region. However, let's say we added in a heteroatom just for poops and giggles. Um, <laughs> These guys over here would be considered alkyl because they are way too far away from the heteroatom. These guys here, on the other hand, the, the hydrogens here, these guys would all be heteroatom, but on the lower end of the heteroatom, so closer to 3 ppm. So whenever you think of alkyl, think of just like really boring carbons and hydrogens. Is there a max number of like bonds away it has to be or no? For the heteroatom, when we're talking about whether or not it'll be in that region, I would say as long as the the carbon that the hydrogen is bonded to is directly bonded to that heteroatom, it will be in the heteroatom region. But if it's like two carbons away, then I would not include that in your heteroatom. That would be alkyl. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, yeah. What about triple bonds? I, we just never, ever had to deal with triple bonds, so that was a great question. I I mean, I guess it would be more de-shielded than a double bond, right? Uh, Rosemary's looking it up. We will... That is pending. Yeah, I, I know <laughs> right. it, but I don't really know it, you know. If Wes puts his legs, I will throw hands. Me too. Okay. All right, so we're going to move on to carbon NMR, and Rosemary will put it on the... Uh, in the chat as me. Okay, so carbon NMR is not like super important to be perfectly honest. I don't think I actually memorized the PPMs for this and I got through the class perfectly fine without knowing them. But in case you guys wanted to know them, you know, we'll cover it. Okay, so this one, as you guys can see, the PPM scale goes like way different than our um, H HNMR. So HNMR is just zero to 12, nice and easy. Um, carbon NMR decided to say, hey, let's make this worse, 0 to 220. <laughs> so in your like um, 10 to 45 region down here, I do want you guys to know it goes in the same order. So this first group here is going to be, I, I wouldn't say you needed to know the scale for CNMR, but if you really wanted to, you could. It might help with some questions, but I mean, honestly, you could get away with just knowing the HNMR. Okay, with that being said, this is our alkyl. Um, so we would just think of those as like the CH3s, so just like these guys like this, so our CH3 here, oh my gosh, I hit the little thing at the bottom, CH3 here, and our CH2 here would be like our alkyls. Okay, um, then of course comes the next group, which once again we did in the previous page, this is our heteroatom. So when we're talking about our heteroatom, this is going to be, I don't know why I drew it like that. Um, they would be these carbons here that are directly bonded to the heteroatom. Um, let's keep going. Um, so that region is from 50 to 75, as you guys can see here. Um, do you guys want me to actually write the PPM shifts next to them? Or are you guys fine with just reading the scale? PPM shifts, please. Okay. Cool with me. All right, so this is 10 to 45. PPM. This one is 50 to 70 ppm. And I could go back and do it for the HNMR um, if you guys want me to. So after our heteroatom comes our double bond, which once again, I feel like it's pretty self-explanatory for this one. Um, 
So this is from 90 to 100, uh, not 100, 90 to 120. And that's just the carbons at the end of a double bond, like these guys here. Um, and then next comes our aromatic. And our aromatics are going to be, once again, we're only caring about benzene. So we're talking about any of these carbons on our benzene ring. Those are all going to be aromatic. And this is from 120 to 150 ppm. And then finally, we have our carbonyl region. So this one has all the carbonyls in it, um, meaning our esters, the ketone and all that, because remember, we're talking about the carbonyl carbon. So it's not like HMI when we're looking at the hydrogens attached to the carbonyl. We are talking specifically about the carbonyl carbon. So let me actually make this bigger. I don't know why I wrote it so small. So give me a minute, guys. All right. And the carbonyl region runs from 170 to 220 ppm. And once again, I'll give you guys kind of like the order that the groups go in. So um, at the lowest end of this, at like about 170 ppm, we will see our esters, our esters, um, and our amides. And then around 180, we will see our carboxylic acid and our ketones. And then around 220 ppm, you will have our aldehyde. And once again, we're talking about the carbonyl carbon in all of these. So all of these groups are in that area. Okay. All right, do you guys want me to go back to the HNMR one and put in the PPM values? Yes, okay. Yes. All right, so let me go back. All right, so alkyl is from one to 2.5. I'm gonna put it underneath because I just realized I used the entire space for this one. Yeah, when I say that I, I, my handwriting is never the same size. So three to five PPM for this one, five to seven for the double bond. Seven to 8.5 PPM. And then finally our carbonyl is going to be nine to 12 PPM. All right, I will zoom out so you guys can take a screenshot of the new one. What was the name of the other one in um, the 180 range? She said carboxylic acid. And then what was the other one? Sorry. Ketone. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. All right. I'm going to go back down to the CNMR so then you guys can see this. All right. So that's basically chemical shift. Do you want me to do uh, normal splitting? Well, I don't know what you have planned for normal splitting. So before we do normal splitting, I just want to explain something super right quick. Can I? Do you want to sit in front of your computer? Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Question in one second. I just want to. Can everybody hear her though? That's the question. Okay. Yes. Okay, they can cool. hear you. I'm a pretty loud talker. <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah, we can hear you. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when we're talking about NMR, someone made a really great point, which was what the heck is shielding and stuff. So Ooh, I love sometimes I forget part. that you guys, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know what I was going to say. So this is a spectrum we have ppm let's say we have zero let's say we have 12 right and what is shielding right so let's say we have a molecule and another molecule those are the atoms right let's say and let's say this yellow is the electron density so here we have a lot of electron density versus here we only have a teeny tiny bit right so over here, let's say these guys are in the middle of like, just chilling in the middle of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, this huge war or something breaks out, right? And now these guys have to like protect themselves, right? But all they have to protect themselves is their electron density, 
So if you shoot an arrow, Hunger Games style, it's going to bounce off. I don't know why I said that. Um, and so let's say you shoot four arrows, right? Three of them are going to bounce off and only one of them is going to hit the inside. Versus this guy, he's super duper not in a good place. So most of them are going to hit him and only one of them is going to bounce off, right? And so you can think of it as this one is at a smaller number because there's a smaller number of arrows hitting it. And the opposite tr is true here. Larger number because more arrows are hitting it. So this one is going to feel a lot more of what's going on in the environment than this one. And this is what we call shielding versus de-shielding. So um, I'm using my hands to talk and I realize you guys can't see me, but that's chill. So this side is what we call shielded. And we also call that upfield. What? Sorry. <laughs> me too. I'm pretty sure I spelled field wrong, but what else? Um, I'm dyslexic, leave me alone. This side is downfield and de-shielded. So this is basically just what we mean when we say shielded, de-shielded, all that kind of stuff. Does this make a little bit more sense for everyone? Yes. Um, what about the frequency? Do we have to know that? What do you mean? I think I, like, I, like one of the first lectures, um, Wes had something like written down like, one has like a higher frequency or like something like that. Don't worry too much about that. Um, the only thing I will say is when it comes to chemical shift, we have to have the chemical shift equation. And this is kind of where we talk about frequency. So we're going to say PPM equals hertz over megahertz. We're not going to do times 10 to the whatever power. Just trust me on that. This is the equation. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, <laughs> and then we have examples of that later on. Just know that that's the equation. And then someone said, go to the here. Cinema page. Car plus curve. Don't worry about it. I got you. I was like, I hope you're covering that because there's no way I'm going to do it. Yeah, <laughs> no, I got you. And guys, if you see me and like looking at the screen with like a resting bitch face, I'm sorry. That's just how my face kind of naturally falls. It wards off unnecessary attention to. So it's a great way. Same. Yes. Same. <laughs> I promise I'm a nice person. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> um. Yeah, for like one question. Yeah, it's literally one oh, question. Funny. Thank you. And they literally give you all the values. So you're just solving for whatever value you don't have. So if you could do like basic math, you should be pretty set. I'm horrible at math. Like the N plus one rule sometimes pushes it for me and I, I can do this one. So <laughs> if we <laughs> can do it, school doesn't every work out. Can. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it back to Katrina just for normal splitting, and then we'll do some whatever comes after that. Complex. Ooh, complex splitting. Rose is doing complex splitting because I uh, forget that. Okay, uh, do you have any specific <laughs> example that you want to go with? <laughs> Math is okay, but memory for me sucks. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Um, is there anything specific you want me to do for complex for splitting? Just do whatever. I'm just going to do whatever, and this is going to be some really ugly looking molecules, and we're just going to suck it up. All right. So normal splitting, we use the N plus one rule, right? So normal splitting, don't worry about anything. N plus one rule. And basically, we're going to assume all the J values are exactly the same for all of them. Um, and yeah. So 
if we went through this giant molecule here, what is the first thing that we need to do? I don't know why I'm asking you guys that. Um, <laughs> like, I'm like, I feel like I'm in person again. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Okay, anyways. Um, we look for symmetry. Yes, perfect. I don't know who King of Trivial Things is, but I like the name. <laughs> Oh, it's Kareem. Oh, oh hey, Kareem. <laughs> okay. Um, so there is no symmetry in this molecule, right? I mean, like, there, there's a ketone over here and there's none over here. So we don't, we know there's no actual, like, symmetry in the molecule itself, but we do have something else. We have something called internal symmetry. Um, so basically we can rotate around this single, single bond. I always say, like, sigma and signal mixed together and it just doesn't come out right so this is a single bond so we can rotate it so that means these two ch3s here are going to be the same right because of internal symmetry the other way i like to think about it is that like this ch3 and this ch3 are both connected to the same carbon so from there they're going to be the same distance from everything else in the molecule so you can think of it either way you want to but um some people like the internal symmetry thing my brain could never wrap my head around it before so we kind of have this internal symmetry going over here Okay, so these hydrogens here are going to be the same. Question for you guys. Is there a hydrogen on this carbon? Yes, perfect. I always like to remind people, don't forget about the lonely, car the lonely hydrogen there because, I mean, he's already left out of like everything, so don't leave him out of this. So... There is a hydrogen here. Hopefully that, yeah, the color contrast is enough. All right, so let's keep going with this. This is another signal. And then we have this last one over here, right? Okay, some people might be looking at me like, are these diastereotopic or anything? Are they? Is there a chiral center present somewhere else in the molecule? No, right? Because this carbon here is really the only other one that could possibly a be a chiral center, but um, it has two methyls attached to it. So no, this is not a chiral center. So these guys are going to be, um, these guys are going to be homotopic. Sorry, I saw something about like <laughs> shitty matrix and I was like, what? <laughs> okay, so now let's go ahead and do the M plus one rule. So let's start with the red ones. Does, do they have any hydrogen neighbors? Once again, I don't know why I'm asking. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. They have one pink hydrogen neighbor, right? So it is our three bond lengths rule. You had to go from hydrogen to hydrogen within three bonds. So hydrogen to carbon is one, carbon to carbon is two, carbon to hydrogen is three. So this pink one is within that. So um, the red hydrogen has one high one pink hydrogen neighbor and that's it so one plus one equals two meaning it will have a splitting of a doublet and if you guys want to know what it looks like that is what a doublet looks like all right so what about our pink one here how many hydrogen neighbors does it have yes annalise it's going to have eight hydrogen neighbors right because we also I can't see them. We also have the blue ones over here. They are within three bond lengths. Hydrogen to carbon is one. Carbon to carbon is two. Carbon to hydrogen is three. So it has... What color did I use? <laughs> this one has six red hydrogen neighbors plus two blue hydrogen neighbors. Put it into the N plus one rule. So 6 plus 2 equals 8 plus 1 equals 9. That was some big math for my brain, I do have to say. So this is called a nonet, or it can just be called a multiplet. And if you guys really want me to draw it out, I can try. Uh, I might have done it. Or this might be a septet. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, I fucked that up. Hold on. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There you go. There's a non-at. <laughs> Counting is hard. I'm not going to lie to you guys. <laughs> Counting is hard. Okay. What about our blue hydrogens over... Did somebody have a question? Yeah. 
Why is it a non -ad a not a not a subset since it, ha it has six neighbors? It has eight neighbors, right? Because it's getting two from the blue hydrogens over here and then six right, from. Right. Yep. All, those. All right, cool. Great question. All right, so now the blue hydrogens here, how many hydrogen neighbors do they have? One, yes, you guys did not get tricked. So the green ones cannot get, the green ones cannot split this one because hydrogen to carbon is one, carbon to carbon is two, carbon to carbon is three, carbon to hydrogen is four. These green ones are four bond lengths away, so they do not get included. So for the blue ones, it has one pink hydrogen neighbor plus one equals two, meaning this is also a doublet, and it looks like so. All right, last but not least, the green ones, they don't have any hydrogen neighbors, right? Because the blue ones are four bond lengths away, which we just counted. Um, I don't feel like counting them again, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this guy has zero hydrogen neighbors. It is a very lonely, lonely signal. So zero plus one equals one, meaning this is a singlet. Oh my gosh, I keep hitting that thing. Singlet, and it just looks like a peak like this. And there we go. Does anybody want me to do integration? <laughs> if not, sure, okay. So integration is just saying how many hydrogens are being represented by that signal. So talking about our red ones, there are six red hydrogens, right? So the integration for this doublet is 6H. For our pink one over here, there is only one of it. So it will be 1H for integration. The blue one will simply be 2H. And the green one will be 3H. And there we go. We successfully did integration. Okay. So question. Yes. So for that, I see you drew the, that dashed line, but so okay. there's symmetry there, but everywhere else there's no symmetry. So like would those three hydrogens still like be the same signal up there or between the two red like these guys here right yeah yeah so basically because um you can rotate this sig sig single bond i'm sorry guys i'm like so special when it comes to that word um this single bond here can be rotated so we can have this methyl up here or we could have this methyl down here so because you can do that rotation, it has internal symmetry. Okay. and But it's just for that, right? Because Yeah, it's just it's for this portion here, here, for those two. Okay. So, yes, that's a great question. Somebody asked how many signals are there in total. Let's go ahead and count it up. We have one, the red one. So one, two, three, four. So this thing in total has four unique hydrogen signals. Okay, does anybody else want me to do another practice problem or do we want to move in to complex splitting? I have a question uh, regarding the four unique hydrogen signals. Mm -hmm. Are these uh, considered to be chemically uh, equivalent, ch chemically shift equivalent? So yeah, they're all going to have different ppm values. So like the red ones will probably are going to be in what region on the chemical shift? Uh, zero to two point five. Yeah, so these guys will be in the alkyl region, and since they're only connected to a CH, um, they're going to be in the lower end. So they'll be around like probably one ppm. Um, this guy here will also be in the alkyl region, but will probably be slightly more shifted, uh, slightly more deshielded. So this will probably be around like one point five. This and these guys are both going to be in the alkyl region, but they're all going to have different ppm values. So, like, I have seen practice problems, and the question would be like, how many uh, chem chemically equivalent, chemically shift equivalent hydrogens we have in the molecule? So we just have to count the the hydrogens. Or the number of signals? The number of unique hydrogen signals, yeah. So it would be like we have four in this one because these red ones are the same signal. So 
these guys here are one signal, this is another signal, this is another signal, and then look, let me just pull a random color. These are another signal. So we only have mm -hmm. four signals on this one. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I think most people said that they wanted to go into, um, my gosh, into complex splitting, which I feel like probably takes more time. So Rose and I are going to switch off again. So I will finally be me again and she will be her. <laughs> so give us a minute. <laughs> Wow, fast switch. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's do the thing. Really, a pizza party? <laughs> we should. It would be so much fun. Okay. Um... Yes, with a formula, complex splitting is way less complex. <sighs> okay. So, complex splitting. Oh, I'm trying to get my apple pencil out of the thing. All right. So, complex splitting, someone in this chat keeps trying to like get the FBI on my tracks, right? This formula is super top secret. You can't tell anyone, all right? But I'm gonna give it to you because I just care about you guys so much, right? So this formula is going to be N1 plus one times N2 plus one. And what the heck does that mean? Well, I'll show you. Calm down, patience, everyone. Totally kidding. Okay, so for a second, everyone was talking about Anthony's, and I was like, what did Anthony say? Like, I was like, what's going on? And then it just occurred to me that that's like a pizza place, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. All right, cool. So, um, yes, all right. So how do we know when it's uh, complex splitting, when it's normal splitting, whatever? Uh, we kind of talked about this before, but wait, hold on. But before I get into that, let's talk about the car plus curve, right? So the car plus curve is this thing. That's all I'm gonna say about it. We don't have to talk too much about it. It's super ugly. You're probably not gonna get any questions about it. Um, just know that this is the thing, right? Cool, good enough. Okay, so uh, coupling constant. Coupling constant is the same thing as a J value. And I actually opened your textbook for the first time in like three years and I got the definition for what a coupling constant or a J value is. So uh, essentially the J value is the separation and frequency of the peaks of a multiplet, whatever. Essentially what this means is that um, the J value is like the value by which a hydrogen is being split. Um, so for the purposes of this class, just kind of vaguely know this concept and memorize these six, um, no comment about Roche, um, and memorize these six. Uh, the most important thing I want to note is that vicinal coupling is like our normal quote unquote coupling. And I know I put six through eight, but it's, it's like, seven hertz usually so this is what we consider normal couple coupling um geminal is also important w is cool um yeah i don't know um what to tell you guys besides this wink wink nudge nudge just memorize these six and you should be fine how would Roche test this? And honestly, I have no clue. Yeah, it'll look exactly like this. I mean, hypothetically, if you had a question kind of like this, it would be this picture, and it'll be, what's the J value? And it's between 11 and 14, hypothetically. V subtle, thank you. Yeah, and what I mean okay. by axial, axial is this hydrogen is axial, this hydrogen is axial. Okay. 
Yes. Which one is the seven for? Is it for the? It's for visceral this coupling. One. I mean, okay. yeah. I am very sorry. I messed up. Um, this is Vicinal. This is Geminal. Ah. Ah. Uh, I very much about uh, blah, blah, blah. I very much apologize. So visceral, we're gonna say seven eight hertz, and for geminal, it's twelve to fifteen still. Um, I had it drawn backwards, so geminal is on the same carbon. Visceral is like the normal signal, so it's one carbon apart. Oh, and someone actually gave a really good, um, it's Kareem. Kareem, my boy. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry, that was weird. Um, if you think of it like Geminal is Gemini, they're like twins, they're on the same carbon. I think that's great. Okay, so, yeah. And the simplified version of this is basically the J value is a value by which a signal is split into two peaks. So, one more time. The J value is the value by which one signal is split into multiple peaks. All right, so now that we got this junk out of the way, we're going to go back up to here. Um, so uh, all that stuff is great, right? In class, they went over for like 20 minutes about the J values and all that kind of stuff. All we need to know in this class is that same hybridization equals same J value. Different hybridization equals different J value. That's really funny. Um, you guys are so funny. All right. So let's look at this bad boy. This is SP3. This is SP2. This is SP2. So I am telling you we're looking at this guy, right? Just because I said so. So we're doing the splitting for the blue hydrogen. And the blue hydrogen has a different J value here than it does here because this is sp2 to sp3. This one is sp2 to sp2. So it's different hybridization, which means different J value. Therefore, this is complex splitting. Cool, we got all the background out of the way. Now we're going to use the super secret formula. So, we know that it's plus one, plus one, right? So, for the blue hydrogen, it's going to have one green neighbor. So, I'm going to call this N1 just because I said so. So, we have one green neighbor plus one. And this is going to be N2. So, it has three red neighbors, right? So now we have four and we have two. And based on the formula, we're gonna multiply here. So this equals eight, yay. Okay, so eight is the multiplicity. And when it comes to naming this guy, it's super simple. The X turns into an of and then we name each side separately. So it's going to be a doublet of quartets. Whatever. I don't think I spelled that right, but whatever. 
I definitely didn't spell that right, but whatever. Yeah. I did? Oh. Fuck yeah. Okay, cool. So this is a doublet of quartets. And yes, I was just about to say, so you start with the lower number. So N1 is going to be the smaller number. Um, but for the purposes of this exam, like if you know doublet of quartets or quartet of doublets, both is fine. He's not going to give you both answers um, to choose from. As long as you can get to eight and you can get this general idea, you should be good. Also, yes. So if you get here, what was like the, what's that word? Uh, like the way you address this basically like why did you circle the h like why did you draw those lines like what's ah, the okay. so yeah basically i circled the h because this is the one we were finding the multiplicity for so i circled it and it was just because i said so and i drew these lines because i was trying to show you guys that um these j values are different so this blue line is showing the j value here and this is showing the j value here i didn't write a number down so i don't really know why i drew those out but that's kind of what i meant by that um so they're asking so it's you can't say the multiplicity is an octet because it's not an octet it's like a yeah splitting where you split two quartets yeah exactly so it's not so okay the reason it's important that it's eight is because that is the multiplicity, right? But we're not going to call that an octet. We call that a doublet of quartets. So it'll look actually like bam, 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 woo, bam, 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 bam. Rosalind, we're just flexing our drawing skills together. Yeah, I'm a really goodly drawer. <laughs> So there are still eight peaks, but they're split up into two quartets rather than one octet. And I think... Somebody asked if they made another tree I ice cream. Um, no, you don't have to reproduce the tree. So what would the question ask? So the question will ask you something like, what is the multiplicity for H? And it'll tell you like this one. Or we could have one other type of problem, but that's going to be later on, so I will point it out when we get to it. Um, Rosemary, how do we know when to do complex splitting and when to do normal splitting? Okay, so the way we know complex versus normal is based on hybridization. So, well, it's, okay, the most correct answer is based on J value. So if it has the same J value, it's normal splitting. If it has a different J value, it's complex splitting. And now the reason, or the way we know J values is based on hybridization, right? So up here, this red one and this blue one had the same hybridization as this pink one. So when we found the uh, splitting for this pink one, all of these had the same J value. However, down here, this blue guy is split by a different J value on the left and a different J value on the right, because those are two different hybridizations. So since they are two different hybridizations, you can't just do N plus one, you have to do this fancy formula. Okay, so would that double bond just be a good indicator? Exactly. Like, is that not... Yeah, you can oh, okay. think of it like if there's a double bond or really pretty much just a double bond. And okay, so... It Yes. Um, just to make sure, so if we are asked about a hydrogen splitting, we look at its neighbors, and if those, like to get to some neighbors, to get to group one of its neighbors versus to get to group two of its neighbors, if those hybridizations are different, then we do complex splitting? Exactly, yep. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. And when you talk about J values, like I thought you were we're referring to like let's say it's like like three bonds away but are you t talking more about like the last slide where it was like geminal vicinal yeah exactly so it's always going to be within three bond lengths the j value is just kind of like um like the orientation but like not really kind of so it's basically like 
Okay, if we have one signal, this signal gets cut into multiple signals, right? And so mm -hmm. if we cut it like this, it's now two signals, and there's a value here, like there's a distance here. So we can say that that distance is the J value. So each okay. of these hydrogens is going to cut its neighbor in half like this. And so when it's complex splitting, each side cuts it by a different distance than in normal splitting, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, another question. So do we have to, will we see when we have three different hybridizations? Like, I don't know, like hydrogen attached to something. Okay, let's... Is that possible? For the purposes of this class, you're going to get something that looks similar to this when he asks about complex splitting. There isn't going to be like big crazy differences. Usually it's a double bond. That's how you know it's complex because it's a different hybridization. And it's usually going to be like two are sp2 and one is sp3 or two sp3 and one sp2. You know, it won't be like lots of different stuff. Okay, thank you. I just, you know, need to make sure I know how much, because I know the formula changes as well. Yeah. Okay, yes. So, swag, basically, is where we finish with that. Um, I'll leave this open for a second. And then we... I don't even know. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, any questions, comments, concerns about anything? At this point, I am going to stop the recording and then start recording again because sometimes it doesn't upload properly. So, to all the people watching later, adios.